Uh, good evening, um, colleagues. Uh, are we... Are our minds here? Okay. Our, our bodies are here, I can see that, but uh, I don't know about our attention and our minds. Um, so, if we're all settled, then I, I would like us to, to start, maybe start with an acknowledgement that uh, our intention, um, as per the invite, we were supposed to start at, um, at 6 o'clock. And I see the time now is slowly approaching uh, 6.45, so we are running behind schedule at least by 45 minutes. Uh, I am hoping that um, the constraints of time uh, are not going to uh, make us lose the quality and the content of the debates that we're supposed to be having here. Um, so now that we're all settled, let me perhaps start by uh, introducing myself as your program director and your facilitator for this evening. Uh, my name is Msingati Sipuka. I am um, with the United Nations Development Program and the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation as a Sustainable Development Goals Advisor uh, and a Program Coordinator for the National Development Pre Plan uh, Implementation Support Program, uh, of which um, the OR Tambo debate series forms an integral part of that support package that um, the UNDP with partners is involved in in terms of driving the implementation of the National de develop Development Plan with within the country. Um, for those of you who are attending the first debate of the series, this is the ninth debate of the War Tambo debate series. Uh, and as I've indicated, um, it is an instrument to support the implementation of the NDP. And previous debates have covered a wide variety of topics that we have felt as um, the partners as being integral and important for um, the implementation of the NDP and changing the face of South Africa as a country as we know it. Um, we have taken a decision um, as the partners to focus the month of November, um, uh, the debate series rather for the month of November on um, this particular topic that we are hosting today under the theme of um, disability inclusive development. And I think as we proceed with the discussion over the course of the evening, we definitely will be able to have an understanding and reflections on what this concept of disability inclusive development means. And I think um, we are going to be receiving a position paper that has been presented, that has been developed by um, the, develop the Department of Social Development and will be presented by Deputy Minister at a later stage, which, which will unpack many of the challenges and issues that surround the topic that we're dealing with today. Perhaps before we start, um, let me start with a couple of acknowledgements. Um, one, um, the partners who are um, involved in the OR Tambo debate series and are bringing us this particular debate, namely the OR Tambo, uh, the, the, OR Tam the OR Tambo and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, um, the WITS School of Governance, of which this debate is hosted for us and has been organized jointly with the WITS School of Law. Uh, and we appreciate all their efforts in terms of bringing, of, uh, bringing this crowd together and ensuring that we're able to be seated here today. Um, then we would have the UNDP, and lastly, as a partner specific to this debate, we, would, we have um, the Department of Social Development. Um, I do understand that from an administrative perspective, the department is led um, by um, DDG, uh, and politically we have the Deputy Minister who we will introduce a little bit later on. But I think before we proceed again, uh, it would be amiss for me uh, not to acknowledge um, the program that was um, on the go um, this afternoon, I believe from about half past 12, Lydia, um, where there was um, a lunch for the veterans of the, dis of the disability movement. 
um, which has culminated into the debate. So I think a special word of welcome, therefore, uh, must go to um, the veterans of the disability movement who have been able to make it uh, to this debate today. I know that in our confirmation list, but I'm not sure whether or not uh, she was able to make it, the MSc for Social Development had indicated that she would be present uh, in Gauteng. Um, if she's here, um, um, she's also acknowledged. Um, and any other guests that I might have missed um, in our acknowledgement list. Um, just to get um, issues of housekeeping out of the way, um, this debate is streamed live, uh, I believe, on YouTube. Um, I've already sent the link to my mom back home. Um, <laughs> hi, mom. Where's the cameras? Hi, mom. Hi. <laughs> I've sent it to my wife as well. Um, I've told her six o'clock uh, we're going to start, so uh, wherever she is, hi. Um, so those of you who would uh, want to gain access to uh, Wi-Fi login. I believe that the Wi-Fi codes are on the walls. I think it's W one dash F one at Vits ICT. That is the password for those of you who want to access um, Wi-Fi for for any reason. All right. Then getting to the business of the day, um, our program is not going to. I, I don't want to hog. Um, the podium. I think we've invited people who are um, well acquainted with the discussion and the topic at hand, and I want to give them the opportunity to be able to um, share their perspectives and their views with the audience, and so that we can be able to have an interactive session where we can be able to um, share opinions um, and perhaps be able to come up with some. Uh, concrete proposals in terms of what needs to be to happen in terms of shaping the policy landscape within the context of the debate that we're having today. So briefly, I've covered the opening and welcome. Um, we're going to, uh, after this, take opening remarks that we're going to receive from the regional representative at interim uh, in office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Ms. Jacqueline uh, Mzoyhera. After that, we will receive the position paper uh, from Deputy Minister of Social Development and a veteran of the disability movement, I'm told, uh, Ms. Henrietta Mahopane-Zulu. You, 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 <laughs> you, 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 my surname, please. Ms. Henrietta Mahopane-Zulu. Can you read what's written there? <laughs> It's my handwriting, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing so fast that I, that I, that I missed it. My father will be very unhappy. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll, t I'll take my hiding after, after the program for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, then after th we've received the presentation on the position paper, we are going to give uh, an opportunity to our panelists, Justice Jacob, uh, Dr. Vuyo Mahlati, and Mr. Edindopo to reflect on the position paper. Um, we will introduce them um, just before we take that section um, properly. And then after that, we take questions from the audience. And then I hope that by the time we get to that stage of the, of the program, we would uh, at least have an interactive session where we will be guided by um, the mood of the audience and uh, also take questions to and from. So I'm not going to necessarily say that we are going to have one <coughs> round of questions, et cetera. We'll be guided by how we're able to move with the program as we proceed. Thereafter, then, we are going to move towards the closing of the program. So um, with that outline, I'd like to um, invite forward for opening remarks the regional representative at, at interim uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Ms. Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ngati. La ladies and gentlemen, Madam Minister, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name. <laughs> um, all protocols observed. Allow me um, to welcome you all to this uh, edition of the presti prestigious OR Tambo debate series on the implementation of the National Development Plan 
with tonight's debate focusing on issues of disabilities. As a woman from Burundi and Rwanda, I like to put both cats on, uh, who fights against all forms of discrimination, because I still am, I, I haven't stopped fighting, it is a great honor for me to participate to this event and to pay tribute to Mr. Oliver Reginald Tambo, someone I always respected and looked up to for ideology, leadership, and resilience. How much the world miss such leadership. His advocacy, belief, thoughts, and actions for justice were unmatched. His unapologetic position for humanity, Ubuntu, equality, non-discrimination, inclusion, participation, and his wisdom to convey it was, has truly been an inspiration um, for many of us. So tonight, hopefully, will be a night of debate, reflection, building bridges, and tolerance for each other point of view to truly celebrate the centenary birthday month of one of our celebrated and iconic African leader. Let us seize this opportunity to get out of our comfort zone and be inspired by Mr. Tambo's legacy like his debate skills. Let's have those comfortable, or shall I say uncomfortable discussions that will include um, uh, people with disability. Let us see them and listen to them, give them the space to educate us and inform us on how to make this world a better place for all and leave no one behind. South Africa unveiled in 1994 a beautiful inclusive constitution which provided protection from all forms of discrimination. Many other countries have also embarked on this historic reforms about their constitution and legal framework, strengthening anti-discrimination laws, combating hate crimes against indigenous people, people with disability, LGBTIQ, foreign nationals, migrants, refugees, and other um, groups. Needless to remind you that it has been 20 years since the Republic of South Africa released South Africa's first ever disability right policy, the Integrated National Disability Rights Strategy, also called INDS. 20 years huh? before even um, the international one. And in 1992, you released a South African Disability Rights Charter. You're really in advance compared to many other countries, especially on the African continent. Even with regard to the United Nations, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and its optional protocol only on 13 December 2006, 14 years later after you at the United Nations headquarters in New York. The Republic of South Africa ratified both instruments without reservation on 30 November 2007, 15 years after your own instrument. You gotta give yourself a round of applause. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> so this year, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the release of the INDS, the 10th anniversary of the ratification of the UNCRPD and its optional protocol, and the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the National Development Plan. So South Africa, you have shown to the world how diverse and tolerant you can be with flair, generosity, and, and warmth. In your own rainbow, or shall I say, colorful way, but in spite of progress made, we are still faced with a lot of challenges. The issue of discrimination and related intolerance is one of today's most critical and indeed most complex human rights challenge. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has consistently called for the protection of the rights of all against all forms of discrimination. The law, as we all know, is not everything. Despite positive changes in laws, there is still a lack of capacity in certain sectors. The good news is that today, attitudes are slowly changing, thanks to your laws, thanks to your policies, and your programs. And there is increasing acceptance and tolerance of all as full, of all as full and equal members of society. 
Nevertheless, prejudice and stigma are sometimes deeply ingrained based on fear of differences, false beliefs, and lack of understanding <coughs> of what it means to be different or what it entails. The United Nations human rights system has and continues to express concern, though through the Universal uh, Declaration, um, sorry, through the Universal Periodic Review, recommendations of the treaty bodies, and a number of urgent appeals sent to all governments around the world by special procedures. It is therefore a relief for us to see South Africa rising again to the occasion and combating discrimination against people with disability and all others by, through your drafting a white paper, setting up frameworks, advocating for equal opportunities in the workplace, in schools, and others, and ensuring that the government fulfills its duty by not only implementing the law, but by reinforcing it and providing remedies to the victims. Successful, successful implementation of the white paper will help South Africa fulfill the promise of its constitution and stand as a beacon of hope, equality, and justice for all people living in South Africa. Tonight's debate promises to be very insightful. So our main question tonight is, How can we make the white paper a living document? How can it be translated into the daily lives of all South Africans? We trust you enjoy and actively participate in a robust debate. And tonight, I encourage all of you to be curious, to reflect, to learn, to teach, to dream, to ask ourselves questions. This is once in a lifetime, I believe. To walk in someone else's shoes. So let's use the content of tonight's debate to bring change, to change South Africa and change the world. Each of the panelists and resource person who, will be who were introduced are all knowledgeable and agents of change. And I'm honored to be here with them tonight. So we invite you the audience and panelists to wear, as my colleagues um, in the UN recommended, a thinking, thinking caps and to think outside the box and contribute freely to this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Um, I think in your presentation you have uh, presented South Africa as a leader in questions of social justice. Um, I think as part of the engagements and the debates that we have today, that is something that we'll have to reflect on, whether or not we continue to espouse those values and, and live them as a country and as a nation. Um, Deputy Minister, um, I, I was sitting next to, my, uh, next to my boss there, and I got a, a serious scolding. And I actually realized that <clears throat> for the first time that there is a huge difference between a B and an M. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the difference between a B and an M sometimes can be your job. <laughs> um, so apologies for that. Um, I acknowledge the, the B uh, instead of the M. Um, I think before we get to the presentation of the position paper, um, I'd like to just briefly introduce our panelists, one, and the deputy minister, number two, so that the audience has a good sense in terms of the people that we've got around the table as part of the panel that we have convened today to share with us their thoughts around, um, the, around the topic and the theme. Our first panelist, um, is Justice um, Zak Yaqob. Um, Zakaria Mohammed Zak Yaqob, born 3 March 1948, is an anti apartheid activist and a former justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. He was appointed to the bench in 1998 by former President Nelson Mandela. 
Justice Jacob has been heavily involved in the activities of the Natal Indian Blind and Deaf Society and the South African National Council for the Blind. He has served on many school committees, parent-teacher bodies, ratepayers associations, and civic organizations. He was the chairperson of the South African National Council for the Blind and was a member of its National Management Committee and its National Executive Committee from 2001 to 2009. He was a member. Um, he was uh, sorry about that. He was a member of the Council of the University of Durban Westville, Westville from 1989 to 1993, and from 1995 to 1997. He was the Chancellor of the University from May 2001 until 31 December 2003. Uh, Justice Jacob was a member of the Technical Committee on Fundamental Rights in the negotiating process. He served on the in Independent Electoral Commission, IEC, from December 1993 to June 1994, and was a member of the panel of independent experts of the Constitutional Assembly. Justice Jacob has also advised local government bodies and national land uh, the National Land Committee and the Department of Finance over the course of his career. So we'd like to thank you very much, Justice Jacob, for gracing us um, at this occasion with your presence. Um, and we look forward to um, your inputs on, on the topic that we're going to be discussing today. So thank you very much. <laughs> Second panelist, um, Dr. Vuyo Mahlati is a public policy and planning specialist. She is currently serving a sec as her second term as the National, Plan as the National Com Planning Commissioner, having been part of the team that released, the South, Afri that released South Africa's National Development Plan 2030. Dr. Vuyo Mahlati has been involved in gender and disability rights as an activist pre and post-1994. She is the International Women's Forum IWF Global Board Director and previously served two terms as the president of IWFSA. On 28 December 2014, Dr. Vuyo Mahlati received the Mail and Guardian Southern Africa Trust Individual Award for, for Drivers of Change. The judges of this award commented that president of the in International Women's Forum of South Africa and entrepreneur, she, typi she typifies the idea of an African Renaissance woman while working both practically and intellectually in the urban development, poverty reduction, gender equality, and policy implementation spheres, she is still committed to the ethos of Ubuntu and care. Her, humi her humility and keen grasp of economic and development issues at the micro and macro levels make her one of Africa's most persuasive young leaders. Uh, Dr. Mahlati holds a BSc from UWC, MSc from the UK London School of Economics and a PhD from the University of Stellenbosch. Um, she has a long history within the disability rights movement of South Africa, having been instrumental in the founding of the Disabled Children Action Group, a national movement of parents of children with disabilities in 1993. Um, welcome, Dr. Slat. Finally, uh, we have got Mr. Edward Ndopu, who is a public intellectual and award-winning human rights advocate. He recently became the first ever African living with a degenerative disability to graduate from Oxford University, where he received a master's degree in public policy. Uh, Edward is the former head of Amnesty International's Africa Youth Program and is also a former research analyst for the World Economic Forum. He is currently the founder and CEO of Evolve Initiative, a global startup that provides advisory services to policymakers and product developers seeking to innovate around the needs of people with disabilities. Edward, a wheelchair user since the age of seven, has been named one of the 50 most influential disabled people in the world by the Short Trust, as well as one of the world's 30 top thinkers under 30 by Pacific Standard Magazine and is a regular on the international conference circuit. So I think we are highly honored to have you with us, Mr. Ndo. And those ladies and gentlemen are our panelists for this evening. Um, with those words, I'd like to call up Deputy Minister Henrietta Bokopane Zulu. 
Um, she has a long history. She has a long history in the disability movement. Um, where in 1996 she was employed the Disability People South Africa, uh, South Africa as national coordinator for Disabled Women's Development Program. She's a founder of the Disabled Women's Achiever Award and co-founder of Disabled Youth South Africa. She has, she is currently serving a fourth term as a member of parliament. She has served on the South African National AIDS Council representing the disability sector. Um, she has co-chaired the Interparliamentary the Interparliamentary Union Advisory Group on HIV AIDS. She is a board member of the Global Power Network Africa. She chaired the AU's um, Specialized Technical Committee on Health, Population and Drug Control. Chaired the UN AIDS Review Committee on the UN Agenda for Women and Girls. And she is currently serving as the Deputy Minister of Social Development. Deputy Minister, you may come up. Uh, now that the obituaries have taken up a lot of time, good evening everyone. Every time when I'm introduced, I feel like attending my funeral all over again. So um, we need to first thank um, everyone for making this day. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you to the panelists, we really appreciate. Thank you DPME for leading. Um, I want people to talk. So I just want to say three or four things so that we have time to talk. I think I've talked since six o'clock this morning. The first thing is um, I always um, had the honor let me say that, to have met Uwar uh, Tambo, the man himself. I've had the honor to work with him in the last years as a member of the many other branches of the ANC and the many deployments. So I, I, I would say uh, it was an honor and a privilege to actually have met Uwar um, Tambo. And one of my favorite quotes that makes me remember him every time I do my work is when he said that humanity is like an ocean. When a drop is dirty, it finds a way of cleaning itself. And I feel like we're there, both in the disability sector, but also as a country at large. And the question around disability and the rights of persons with disabilities, depending on which English you want to speak, that of the queen or that of the US, you can choose whether you're gonna say persons or people, Really, it's a question of uh, language. As a Motswana girl, I just thought I must say, my surname is Bukhupani. Uh, that's my father's surname, Zulu, is the <coughs> husband that married me. So you don't have to remember the two. You just have to remember I'm Henrietta, because the two can change any time. And I don't think when you meet me in the street and I'm already Mrs. Kukemur, you still want to say Miss mm -hmm. Zulu. So for women, they know that it's patriarchy. Anything that comes after your name is patriarchy, so don't remember it. Remember Henrietta, and the rest um, is patriarchy. Born as a disabled girl in the rural village of Puking, being my first, I always like to use my own story to make sense, because I think when we tell our own stories and add inclusive development to it, it makes sense. So born after many years of my parents being married, you know, in the past, boys were more valuable than girls. Mm -hmm. Yes, so they were all expecting this amazing boy. And there I came. Firstly, I was a girl and a blind one, so that didn't help matters at all. So the problem started. And many years later, there's six of us at home, three of us that can't see. And um, my parents realized that it's a genetic condition, so I have them to blame for my blindness so they had to treat me nice because I can <laughs> terrorize them. So in a way, inclusive development started in my own home. But it started in a sense that even though I'm the eldest, my brothers and sisters would complain about who is going to look after me um, this weekend in my presence. And being me, I would enjoy the, the discussion yeah, but I, I sat with her last week as if I needed caring, but I enjoyed that because it said to me I'm very powerful, I matter, and their whole lives revolves around me. So since that time, I've always felt special, 
and hmm, yes. I can talk about inclusive education because my first daughter has me to blame for her disability because I gave her my blindness, she's 27. And my 14 year old, I also gave her my blindness and she's 14. So being 46, having a 27 year old and a 14 year old, I think I'm best qualified to actually make and give the value chain, which is what the position paper is about. It's all about where we come from and where we are going. And having that in the house makes it easy. So when you start the discussion and hearing from our panelists, let's start by answering the question, who excluded who and why? Because today we're talking inclusive development. So we need to be able to find the answer that says who excluded who, when and why. Because if we find the answer to that, we will be able to develop inclusive programs because we would understand who excluded who and why. We always use the example of the women's movement. And one of the examples when we fight gender equality, we would say women don't want us as disabled women because they see us as the weaker part of the women's movement. And therefore, um, the lesser they involve us as disabled women to the struggle, the stronger and important they feel. And that would lead to them being able to talk about women's issues without really having to deal with the issues around women with disabilities. And that is a practical example of inclusive development because inclusive development is about your everyday life. And when people with disabilities in South Africa in 1984 during the hype of apartheid said enough. I want to say the struggle was not against government. The struggle was against professionals providing a service to people with disabilities. And that determined the power relations. So the social worker had more power to decide what you're gonna eat tomorrow morning, what you're gonna dress without consulting you. And in 1984, disabled people were tired of being told by somebody else how to live their lives, what to do, how to talk, how to dress, where to sleep, and they revolted. Like all of us, like black people in South Africa, fighting apartheid, it's the same thing. And the journey is the same. So when you talk about development, it is important that we look at what kind of indicators are we setting? What kinds of outcomes are we expecting? And if we don't set disability inclusive indicators, surely we are not going to get disability inclusive outcomes. So addressing that problem, I think um, the Office on the Commission for, for Human Rights have outlined the journey. We endorsed the journey and the journey was all about that. We wanted real rights, rights that we can feel, rights that we can touch, rights that we can experience, and rights that we can ride home about. That's what we wanted. And that's what we are still wanting. We have the white paper, but we are at a crossroads as South Africa. And disabled South Africans, when President Zuma took the podium and said, um, the Ministry on Women, Children, and People with Disabilities will be, they all jumped. Yeah, but we want to be in the presidency. Why? And they make noise, and then so the noise went, and then the ministry existed, and the ministry came, and then the next thing, President Zuma took the podium. Oh, well, you've been moved to social development. Yo, they took up to the streets again. Now we worse off welfare cases. Hey, these people, and we all watched on, and everybody exercised their right. They did the street aerobics exercise, and everybody jumped and screamed and shouted. And the president said, okay, well, we'll have a presidential working group on disability. Everybody went like, oh, at least that brings us closer to power can at least taste the power. But we've never been offended. I mean, as a disabled deputy minister in social development, I always understood what the fight was about. And the fight was about development. The fight was about being contained in a particular space. It was never about focal point 
or location. Mm -hmm. It was about how are we going to, uh, to be treated? Is social development now going to be the one providing transport for us? Is social development now going to be worrying about clinics? We don't want the containment. We want inclusion across government, inclusion across society. We don't want to be owned by anyone. And that was lived through even during the negotiations of the UN Convention. For the first time in the negotiation of treaties, the United Nations and all its bureaucrats finally realized that they cannot pull this thing off. They don't have the expertise. Even the most well-experienced negotiators sitting at the UN doing nothing but talk the whole day couldn't do it. So it was a logical thing. They had to turn to the NGOs and organizations of disabled people. And for the first time, <laughs> the General Assembly was filled with people with disabilities. And for the first time, the inaccessibility of the United Nations headquarters became very glaring. Mm -hmm. It was in their face. Everybody was frustrated. Disabled people were frustrated. The UN staff was frustrated. And before every session, the war would start. It would be us and them. But from those days as we went and spent the 14 painful days in America, missing pap at home and morojo, we finally came up with this thing. We fought back home, we signed it. Now we've given life to it through a white paper. We'll hear tonight because that's what we want to hear. Have we arrived? Are we there yet? If we have arrived, what are the indicators, what are the signs we must look for that says, welcome to disabled people, we have arrived. If we are in a journey, are we on the freeway? Are we off-ramping? Are we driving 120 or 200? What is the speed that we are supposed to drive? And which direction must we be headed? And that is where we are here today, for you to provide the answers. But above all, as a department, we have produced the white paper and we have asked the question to people with disabilities as the rights holders themselves to say, is the white paper good enough? Do you still want a disability act despite the fact that you will find disability in all the different legislations? We'll hear from them. I call them them because sometimes I'm not one of them because I'm on the other side. You know, it's very difficult to be in government, even though we fight and say self-representation, nothing about us without us. When you are on the other side, they disown you. But they are the ones that said nothing about us without us. Somebody has to do the job. So they now need to tell us, is the white paper good enough? Are we still have to roll up our sleeves and come to a disability act? It's all about the rights holders that must chant the way and guide government on the direction government must take. We are not going to do it. We're the duty bearers. All that we did is the white paper to make sure that disabled South Africans have recourse. If they don't chant the way, hey, men, it's good for us to sit back and struggle along and try to do the best that we can. We've acknowledged that data is information, data is power, data is important for development, for planning. So we've passed the Disability Inequality Index as an instrument that's going to assist us as government to plan, but also that will give South Africans time, energy to actually say, where are we? And we've made sure that we start with non-financial data, we start with administrative data, and we hope that the instrument will grow. Please make input to it. Unless you input on it, it's not gonna be alive. We want it to live. Um, we've taken to parliament. We committed when we presented the white paper that we will report to government annually on the progress we are making or the lack thereof on issues of disability. 
We will be launching the report as soon as cabinet, it's gone through the cabinet committee. So very, very shortly, you will all get to know where we are as government. And it is important for me to say sometimes I feel like strangling leaders of the disability movement because they drag their feet and don't come to the party on time until the party is over. And they always get there after the party. And sometimes the after party isn't there. In this case, we have also will be launching the universal access design document so that we have standards. We have standards, EN17, engineering standards that nobody seems to respect when they build, so we're increasing the building inspectors. It's a demand. It's all about inclusion. So we also have the reasonable accommodation. All these instruments are just words on paper. Unless disabled people give life to them, they will never live. But we, as government, will be very happy to stand on platforms like these and code them, because they will be there whether they are there to change the lives of disabled people, I will hear from our panelists. And I would like to hear what are the long term, short term, what is it that we are doing, what must we do differently, and we all ears. We are here to do nothing but listen. So guide us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister. Um, I, I just want to perhaps place something into context uh, from a process point of view in terms of where the, the debates themselves are located and the process thereafter. Because I think it's important uh, for the audience to understand that the work that we're doing here tonight is not simply about hosting the debate and thereafter we disperse and it ends there. One. This is part of a broad uh, process of supporting implementation of the National Development, Development Plan, as I indicated initially. So, one, we, it, we've got scribes and repertoires here who are going to note and take down all the comments that are going to be coming in. But subsequent to this session, what we do as uh, the partners uh, of the Ortambo debate series is that we organize deep dives, which are policy environments which take forward the discussions that were held in the, in the debates in order to refine them and to come up with concrete policy proposals that can then be infiltrated back into the system of government in order to try and influence from a policy point of view and some of the issues that have come out of these sessions. So I'm trying to say in echoing uh, what Deputy Minister is saying in a very long-winded way, um, this is not just a debate, but it is an initiation of a policy discussion on how we can ensure that there is inclusion across all sectors and all spheres of government. I think that is the message that I wanted to pass. Um, and we've got, we've kept registers, so we will ensure that the stakeholders that are here would be part of the deep dives as well. This is the last time that I'm going to be speaking tonight. I'm going to be handing over um, to the panelists. Um, we had sent out the position paper um, to them, so they've gone through it in detail, and they've also internalized, I hope, the reflections of the Deputy Minister that she's just done now. So they would then use both um, the position paper and the input to make critical reflections in terms of the issues that have been raised. So um, perhaps let's start from the right, my right, uh, with yourself, Dr. Masati, and then we would move uh, to justice, and then uh, Eddie will end, will end off with yourself as, as initial reflections, and then we will take questions, but we'll bring in Deputy Minister a little bit later on as well. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Oh. Okay. Is it okay if I speak from here? Yes. I was hoping that the justice was going to speak first, but um, let me just follow protocol and instructions. Honorable Deputy Minister, thank you for the opportunity, and also the leadership of the United Nations Development Program and all programs of the United Nations in South Africa represented here. 
the panelists and the esteemed judge, I think it's really a privilege to be on the same panel and the very, you know, impressive panelist who's on that side. And also all the people who are here, esteemed guests, we really appreciate you being here because we're hoping to have a really robust debate as this is. Mine is just to sort of highlight some of the critical issues. But I, allow me just to briefly talk to where we are, why we are here, wh why it's important that we are here, not why we are here. The Deputy Minister gives us the background. <coughs> But I think it's important, I mean, to speak on this day um, because this aligns with also, there's so many celebrations that we, you know, that today sort of, or this gathering is contextually aligned to and with. It's the International Day of Persons with Disability coming on the 3rd. And this day um, was very important because when it was proclaimed in 1992, it was at a time when South Africans were engaged in ensuring the inclusion and integration of people with disabilities in our change processes as part of dismantling apartheid. As you heard earlier on, that the charter was launched around 1993. Around the time of 1992 was a very busy time in South Africa working around the charter. But what is important as well is that the celebration today is also in within the 20 years of the celebration of the Constitution. And this is very important um, from a disability perspective because really, you know, as you know, we still have to say more. I mean, the gathering this afternoon was actually making all of us appreciate what went behind the scenes to get us to where we are. But most importantly, um, it's critical to appreciate the link between the Constitution and the life of <coughs> Dada O'R Tambo. Because this was the seventh leader and visionary who paved the way for the gains that we celebrate today. When he took the reins as the ANC Secretary General in December 1955, he had been the acting ANC uh, Secretary General. And this is important, as you were earlier reflecting that South Africa was always ahead, because the Freedom Charter, again, was just ahead of the United Nations from a human rights perspective. Because it was in 1955, and it was, and Utatutamo <coughs> was very central in those processes. So I, I highlight this because it's, it's really um, fitting for us <coughs> to be gathered as part of these uh, debates in his name. Because this time when we are reflecting, it becomes important that we look at what we have done and what we need to still do. So one of the <coughs> critical things that I would like uh, to highlight <coughs> is that it is important, I mean, going back to the question of making the white paper a living document. It's important to appreciate that us getting here was because of a lot of sacrifices by people with disabilities particularly. And one of the important issues to understand, which we are missing, is that the Constitution, the Charter, and all the, 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 the documents and frameworks, the conv you know, are basically an important illustration we didn't cut, this is one area where there was no cut and paste. I say it because to some degree I was part of it, some of the processes, particularly the charter process. And what was interesting, as earlier said by the Deputy Minister, a man or people, I would call the leader specifically Friday Mavuso and Maria Ranto because the living are still living. 
but those are, you know, too, I'd like to cite them because what they did in leading the disability movement was a revolutionary approach which actually took us away from a, a paternalistic uh, and very sort of a discriminatory and isolationist approach of treating people with disabilities in the most derogatory way from the families out to professionals, you know, in terms of the institutions of learning, institutions of health, but generally in society. What the disability movement under the disabled people of South Africa did was basically to say, we are freeing ourselves. And they started doing this by acting. And I think that the work that was done by people with disabilities themselves, they pushed away the professional approach not just the social workers, the occupational therapists, physiotherapists, everybody. I was one of those people. And they would sit you down and say, you are not going to tell me what to do because I know what is good for me. The self-help movement was one of the most amazing revolutionary ways of basically demonstrating the will to do away with the welfareist approach that was oppressive. And I mention these because when we look at the white paper as a living document, it's important first and foremost to appreciate the fact that the people who took us to that level liberated themselves first. And what we're needing to do now is to ensure that we create the right kind of institutions that will take it further. Let me come to my role in terms of representing now the National uh, uh, Planning Commission. We have all these documents, but I believe the first and foremost thing as I go towards conclusion is to move beyond the rhetoric. But we must never underestimate these documents. We live in a world we've seen throughout the world. Things change all the time. If you don't have these frameworks, sometimes that's all that you can let on in generations to come. I've been involved <coughs> in constitution-making processes, even in Tunisia. It's when you appreciate that what we manage to do now, we cannot manage to do you, you can't come up with the same constitution today. That's how difficult life is, and that's how life changes. So it becomes important, but let us move beyond the rhetoric. One of the critical things that we're needing to do, we have the National Development Plan, and we appreciate the fact that with the support of the UN, we have managed to come up as a country with a disability disaggregated NDP, which provides a roadmap for an inclusive society. So what we need to do now is to look at the implementation plan, Deputy Minister. Our implementation plan must prioritize what it is that we are needing to specifically focus on the basis of the needs at this point and going forward. That includes an integrative approach to implementation. The integrative approach to implementation must be clarified by indicators. What we're doing with the National uh, Planning Commission now is to specifically focus on these uh, indicators and we'll be doing roadshows where we're looking at how far are you in terms of implementation. But it becomes important that in the route and trajectory to, to inclusion, we deal with the enablers for inclusion. We really need to sit down and elicit very clearly and specifically across the board in terms of what are the enablers for 
a child who is disabled, who lives in Kunu. What are the, basically, the enablers for a child in Goangoa? What are the enablers for a child in, 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 in Deep Sloot? What are the enablers for a child who is in the suburb? Because across the board, there are needs. So as we understand these enablers, we begin to, up, to sort of come up, because we say as part of the NDP, for instance, if we take our infrastructure, that we need to raise the public infrastructure spending to 10% of the GDP. So we need to be able to say, what does that mean? in terms of the specific priorities for the enablers around infrastructure for people with disability. We're talking energy, we're talking water, we're talking public transport, for instance, which is a big issue. In a country where 80% of what is called public transport are the taxes. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? You know, so I think that if we are not going to be specific and begin to look at mechanisms that are going to specifically focus in the area, then we are going to miss it. Another area that I wanted to conclude with is the area of institutions. You know, chapter seven of the convention talks to the importance of coordination in institutions. I do believe that we still haven't got it right as far as people with disabilities specifically. <coughs> We started with the office on the status in the presidency. We moved to the Ministry of Women and whatever, and, and, and we <laughs> there, were many, there were many women, children, and you, you know? No, 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 no. Oh, no there, there was no only youth. three of them. So we moved from there, we moved from there to the Department of Social Development. I am still not convinced that, you know, and the issue is not where we are. The issue is how do we manage to leverage and ensure, you know, whether we are in social development, make sure that Treasury has prioritized that budget. Make sure that the Department of Energy is clear with the budget on the spending for people. To, across the board, all of them, I would call them. So. That is not happening at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as that is not happening, I mean, we were just talking earlier about the issue of education and who is supposed to be funding mobility facilitators. So I think that, you know, coming out of these debates, we need to actually, again, be very specific and articulate about the meaning of institutional mechanism. So I think where I am, the last thing is the technology innovations. When we look at employment, you know, this is another thing. I mean, I run a factory now. I'll be honest with you. The methodology that I use, I got it from Friday Mavuz. And it, it is something that I feel all of us need to look at again. And you know, what they did Friday Mavuz was to say, away with sheltered employment. Let's look at how we can begin to integrate people within the mainstream of the economic value chain and build institutions that assist people within an integrated environment. So I think that the technological innovations, ICT and broadband, and a strategy specifically for people with disabilities, more particularly within the digital industrialization space, is actually a great opportunity for people with disabilities. And I think that our focus now needs to move with the times. And I really will stop you know, at that to say, I believe the <coughs> opportunity is big and the lessons from the past are great. All we need to do is to pay, and DBSA has to wake up. Because we managed to get to where we are because there was a strong movement of people with disability. We're not feeling that now. I have to be honest sitting here. And until we do, things should be moving. Thank you.
Okay. 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 The mic is on. Okay. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, in the interest of all of us being equal, I'm not referring to anybody in particular because there's time. There's no time. But more than that, I believe that all of us are absolutely equal. Mm -hmm. And if I mention some and don't mention others, I'll be insulting those I do not mention. So as a matter of policy nowadays, mm -hmm. I never mention so-called important people at the beginning of my speech as a matter of policy. But let me start with, with uh, I, I, I think that the starting point is really the disability movement in South Africa and our constitution. And we'll go through some of the provisions in a moment, but I want to start by making this distinction or to, to, for, uh, to, to explain the dynamic interaction, if you like, between theory and practice. You can have the most wonderful theories in the world you like, but you've got to evaluate them by saying, what consequences have these theories having been, whether they, how, to what extent have they been put into action, and to what extent have people with disabilities improved as a result of it. Now, I have no doubt that many of us here are powerful intellectual human beings. Many of us with disability here are comparatively powerful, and many of us here have benefited a great deal from the movement that we have been talking about. The trouble is that the majority of the people with disability, people who are marginalized, people who have nothing, no food, no clothes, no home, who live deep in the rural areas and have been hidden away, there are literally millions of people in that category as opposed to the few of us who are here who continue to lead absolutely and utterly miserable lives. And I come from an environment where, and I'll give you an example of why I feel very disillusioned in relation to theory and practice. I come from the blindness sector. There was a report produced some time ago which made it plain how miserable the position of children were in, in, in schools for special education in South Africa. Of course, they had to be there because no inclusive facilities were available. We'll talk about that in a minute. But facilities were lacking completely and absolutely. We made representations to parliament as leaders. Nothing has yet happened in those schools. We need mobility instructors in these schools to ensure that blind kids are, are, are able to move around by themselves. That's not, that is enabling. That is not uh, putting them into a category. They need the service, they must get it. It doesn't happen. We need hearing aids. Our, our society deals with blind and deaf people. We need hearing aids and that sort of thing. None of these things happen. So unfortunately, my perception is that except for the few of us who have benefited, and I am grateful for that, for the majority of people with disability in this country, vast majority, life is still hell. So I feel absolutely happy about myself and where I am. I feel very good for all of you who are empowered and wonderfully empowered so. But I think that we have not got there. We have missed the trick. We have got away talking inclusion while the majority of, peop of people with disability in this country has remained in misery and starvation mode. And unless we do something about that, we are going to be in very, very serious trouble. And we must not complete the theoretical and theorization process before we start action, because that is an excuse for non-action, you see. You spend years and years building up your theory and building your organization and so on and do nothing in the meantime. The test is what action are we taking? What action is government taking 
in relation to the millions of starving people with disability, the thousands of people who are in schools who are suffering. And I don't, let not, if, if it was possible, kids with disability being in a normal school is absolutely wonderful. I have no doubt about that. If you have only a, a, a disability where you can't walk and if you're intact otherwise, all you need to do is have accessible premises and you'll find in those schools. And we need to think very carefully how inclusive we can afford to be. Can we have, if we have one uh, blind child or one deaf child in a school, or uh, a child who has some other disability in a school, can we provide all the facilities? We can't do it now. Can we provide the braille for one kid in a school? Can we provide the mobility and orientation instruction for a single kid in a school? Can we provide sign language tuition for a single deaf kid in a school? Do we have the facilities to do that? So unfortunately, the people with disability, the millions of them, in my view, are going to remain in exactly the same position as the majority of starving people in our country. In other words, you can never have a privileged lot of people with disability doing well, because if 90% of the ordinary population is suffering 90% of people with disability will also suffer. You might reduce that to only 80% would suffer, but that doesn't actually help. So our lives are tied up with poor, starving people with disability, but also poor, starving people with no disability. All of us here are, are privileged. We are much better off than 10 million people who, do, who are not blessed with any disability at all, but who live in do, deep rural areas and suffer. Let us spare a thought for those people. We are a privileged lot. We can afford to sit here and talk. Let us ensure that those of us who have disability and are powerful use our power to help those people let us ensure that we use all the bits of spare money we have to benefit those poor people because we, uh, people with disability, also have a responsibility to poor people because we are empowered people with disability and we actually need to do that. The other thing I wanted to say is that it is not government that does it all. It is not law and legislation that does it all. Our constitution and all the world instruments say that men and women are equal. But 90% of women even believe that men are superior. There are many, many men who believe that men are superior. I mean, men believe that they are superior. And unless we change that, we are not going to get anywhere. It's not a question of what the court holds and what the Constitution says. We've got to engage in a social revolution to change the hearts and minds of people. And so it is with people with disability. We get jobs and so on, and yet, leave aside the state, in the private sector, it is extremely difficult to persuade an employer to make the necessary accommodation and give people jobs. It is extremely difficult to ensure that people with ability regard us as ordinary human beings and regard us and treat us with the respect they deserve. They either feel sorry for us, they refuse to understand us people with disability, they probably wipe a tear or two and then go home and enjoy their own lives when they see people in a wheelchair or a blind person or something like that. Because whatever we say about the United Nations and so on, the attitude of these people with ability in this country, those who have the trouble of having no disability in this country, is really so uneducated that it amounts almost to criminality. And that is because they don't know and they don't want to know 
empowered people like us can fight with them. Unempowered people, and there are millions of uh, people with disability who are unempowered in this country, mm. cannot fight with them. And they get run over all of the time. So I want to say we are privileged. Let's start a social revolution. Let us understand that poverty is one of the major problems we have. Let us understand that we are privileged in this society. And let us understand that it is we who are privileged who need to improve the lot in action through pushing government and to, through persuading people to improve the lot, not of exceptional people like us. That's easy. You, you, you will get 2 or 3 percent of highly intelligent, exceptional people in every disability. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the average person who gets himself or herself steamrolled in society. And I have seen it in the rural areas in the most miserable way. People with disability who get hidden. So in my view, the theory is good. For me, it doesn't matter whether you have one disability act or disability gets uh, treated separately. These are in different pieces of legislation. These are matters of theory for me which matter very little. As long as we do the work, we make the money available, we reduce the poverty, and we reduce this horrible corruption in our country so that more money is available to enable poor people, to enable poor people with disability, and to enable everyone else in our country. So the enablers are to reduce poverty and to empower poor people to develop their own approach and do it that way. So I have a somewhat different approach. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay, well, let me start by saying how delighted I am uh, to be here. Uh, I think that this is a very timely uh, conversation. And in some ways, my interventions this evening sort of sit uh, quite snugly between um, what both my co-panelists have sort of articulated and their provocations um, this evening. I would say that I am I'm not very optimistic about the state of disability rights and the state of disability justice, not only in South Africa, but globally. I think about the landscape that we're operating in uh, from a global context. We are in an unprecedented moment, historically and politically speaking. Uh, the world is confronting numerous challenges from deglobalization, so what we're bearing witness to in terms of what's happening in the context of nationalism throughout the world, the United States, uh, Brexit, um, and, and various other countries. We've seen deglobalization in action. Over and above that, we are having to grapple with the very real manifestations of climate change and what that means for the future of humanity. We are having to also grapple with deepening inequality. The Oxfam reports every year allude to this about less than 80%, uh, less than 80 people in the world own more than half the world's wealth. And so when I think about this global context and I think about what's happening as a global society and the future of humanity, I ask myself, what is the intervention of disability? Where does disability fit into this discourse and how does it influence that discourse? And the reason why I think this is particularly important is because I believe that the discourse that we are having around disability tends to not move beyond the representational. Mm -hmm. What would it mean to reimagine disability as a methodology, as an instrument, rather than just an identity that we embody? So in the context of development, we have not adequately pushed back against the discourse of development to ask of it, what is it that the development discourse can learn from disability? What is the offering? 
what is the intervention that disability makes in the context of development? And this is a very different framing of disability than just saying that we need disability to be to, we need disability to be included in development. It's about saying that disability on its own terms already provides a framework for the ways in which we can think about disability uh, think about development from an entirely new perspective. So I, I'm I'm going to disagree slightly. Um, with you, Justice, and say that I think we need a return to theory. Because I think the way that we've been theorizing about disability in the context of public policy is fundamentally flawed and wrong. In the context of technology, and I'll pick up on, on, on the, the points that you ended off with, uh, Dr. Mathati, when you spoke about technology and, 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 and the invitation that technology brings um, in the context of you know the for, what the World Economic Forum calls the fourth industrial revolution and the opportunities that are associated with that. Many of the world's top technology companies are looking to disability for inspiration in terms of product development. So whether we are talking about the iPhone and Siri or we're talking about Amazon, all of these technologies that are the talk of the town as far as technology is concerned, those technologies are grounding their product development design in disability. They look to disability for inspiration. So for example, I can, I can speak to my phone and it is able to call somebody, if I find myself stranded and I need assistance, I'm able to use that device for assistance. So clearly, disability is being <coughs> leveraged as a site of innovation. It's being leveraged as a site of innovation in the technology space, but not being leveraged as a site of innovation in the context of public policy. And so there's something very strange going on where we see disability being mobilized to inform thinking, to inform practice as a theoretical framework, but that is not the case when it comes to public policy. So if we know that disability offers us um, it, that disability, that when, you, that when we improve the needs of people with disabilities, that that has positive externalities for everybody else, right? We, we know this. We know that if we make sidewalks accessible for people with mobility devices, it means that um, a parent who's pushing um, a, a pram, that they're able to utilize that very same sidewalk, right? There are positive externalities that go beyond disability. If we recognize that, that disability offers us a site of innovation that can improve the lives of everybody else, then why is it not being mobilized on its own terms to inform public policy? Why, why the insistence on, on disability as being pigeonholed into development but not informing the framework of development. So this is a slightly different framing that I think we need to insist upon because the current moment that we are living in, rapid technology, this is going to be catastrophic, not just for people with disabilities, but for everybody that is residing in the global south. We are all, we, we, we are doomed if we cannot see what's happening in terms of the, the rapid change of, 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 of geopolitics and what's happening globally. It, entire industries are being reimagined as we speak. Um, driverless cars um, are not a thing, uh, it's not a figment of our imagination, this is real. It's happening, which means various automobile industries are going to have to come to terms with the fact that in the near future they may be going out of business. Again, what is the contribution of disability? What is the contribution of the discourse to what's happening within the global landscape? And I think it's important to mention this because I think we have an opportunity as a society, as South Africa, to be able to leapfrog. We, we don't have to follow a linear path. We don't have to wait until people with disabilities acquire the very bare minimum in terms of development before recognizing that disability can be a site of innovation that can be mobilized and leveraged to push back against the development discourse itself. 
So those are some of my thoughts. And then the other um, thought that I had, and, and Minister, you uh, asked us to think critically about the question of who is oppressing who and why. And I think that in the context of disability, we need to be very clear that the forces of ableism, disablenism, able body supremacy, whichever term you want to use, that those forces are alive and well, and that those forces need to be deconstructed and interrogated. So we cannot just have a conversation that sits at the individual. That conversation has to take into account the structural power that positions people with disabilities where we are today in society. That needs to be woven into our conversation. So it's not good enough to just say exclusion. No, we need to say ableism. We need to say oppression on the basis of disability. And the reason why we need to say this is because to sanitize the discourse and say exclusion or discrimination or inaccessibility obscures the ways in which people with disabilities continue to experience isolation, neglect, and trauma on an epic scale. So incorporating a, a precise language into our analysis of what is happening, I think, will make us more attentive to the brutality of the forces of ableism that continue to function in the lives of people with disabilities each and every single day. All right. Um, I've just uh, received a free lecture. Um, so wh what we will what we will do? I hope that we've got a we've got a roving mic. Um, can someone please assist us with that uh, roving mic? All right. From a from a process point of view, I think what we can do is to um, request the audience to either comment, pose questions um, to specific panelists or the deputy minister, or alternatively, pose questions or comments to the panel as a whole. And as we, as, as we receive those, uh, we will then, at the end, uh, get the panelists to respond to the individual questions posed to them, but also to the general questions that have been posed and to the remarks that have been made. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily want us to take an approach where we confine certain questions to certain panelists. We can respond to them as a panel. So the intention of the session is to create a conversation between the panel members themselves and the audience um, around the questions that have been raised. Um, and of course, we're going to be getting the Deputy Minister involved in that conversation in terms of um, the responses and the general conversation that we're going to be driving. So I'd, I'd like us just to, to relax and have a free conversation around these issues. There are a couple of points that I personally have noted for myself in terms of perspectives. Um, that have been shared, but I, I'm not going to get into that. The platform is yours. So we've got a roving mic. Um, I'll take the first set of hands. Um, I'll give specific numbers to that, so if you can just note your number, and then we will get you to comment. That's one. That's two at the back. There's three here. There's four. There's five. All right, let's take those, and then we'll, we'll come back for a second round. Oh, it's on, just wanted to check. Um, good evening to the panel. Thank you so much for the, um, for the invite to the debate. It's been quite a hectic, um, um, yeah, everybody. It's quite a lot of information to process, and so I'd just like to quickly introduce myself. My name is Abongile Kandini. I have worked and volunteered with various NGOs, some of them being the United Nations. I've worked extensively in the um, SDGs when I worked for the South African Institute of International Affairs as a youth ambassador. And I have become quite involved as an albinism and disability activist 
over the past six years and observing the landscape of albinism and disability in in the country and in the world. So, um, the, you know, the nearest thought that comes to me is from our recent panelist who spoke. And I really, really enjoy the idea of reframing what disability is and looking at it at, um, as, a, as a point of leverage and, and assessing what it is actually that we can gain from disability. And you asked, well, well in more than, not, not exactly these words, you asked, but why are we stuck? Why is it only just the IT and the, the, you know, the technology industries that are able to optimize um, disability, you know, so they can create series or they can create, you know, uh, Samsung can make things that can talk to you and they can speed talk or speed dial people or, um, you know, open things for you or even write your notes. Um, and I have, a, you know, a potential answer. I think um, it's because disability globally has been associated with just non-positive um, words. You know, the word disability itself is nothing I want to be associated with. And I know I have a disability and I'm visually impaired, but ask a lot of people with disabilities who are struggling, they don't want to be associated with a negative word such as disability. It's, um, it breaks the spirit. It doesn't say anything about your improvement or the potential that you have to grow. Um, it doesn't say anything about the abilities that you could have if you were given the right resources. And so for a very, for, for decades, and even through our South African veterans working through their movement, I don't think the focus was the language. And I think now it's time to really look into the language, which refers to what the justice spoke about, about theory. And I think theory is quite important. It's reanalyzing what must work in the theories if we were to move forward with disability. And for me, for example, um, I, 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 I theorize a lot about my activism. So for instance, for, um, to combine the two ideas of you know, um, optimizing and um, leveraging disability and theory, I looked at albinism and I thought, well, why are people with albinism so, so dis disliked in communities? Why are we so rejected? Um, why is it that people just can't sit settle with us if they have issues with people with albinism? And then, you know, I toyed with a few possibilities and one of them was maybe it is because it has issues of whiteness. Now, Albinism is a genetic anomaly where any race of people can be born with a genetic anomaly where your skin is white or a different variation than there are 11 types of albinism. So it manifests in different ways. But I thought, you know, with my, with the most common form of albinism being um, achillocutaneous albinism affecting the eye, uh, hence making many people with my type visually impaired, is that you look white to a black person. And we have a history of white oppression. So to a black person who's had a history of white oppression, any representation of whiteness stings. And as much as you may want to relate to it, you just can't shake how uncomfortable that feeling is. So to me, I look at albinism as a tool of reconciling the country where we can look at albinism and go, it doesn't matter what race you are, really. I mean, you could have an Indian, Asian, Chinese colored person standing right before me, and you wouldn't know what race we were. But because of albinism, it doesn't really matter now, does it? But we are united as a people, so we can reconcile our issues of division. And that's what I think the power of leveraging disability and re-theorizing uh, re around disability can really create in the country. Thank you. Well, um, thanks very much. I'm not sure who the mic goes to. Oh. Um, the person who normally speaks first has got the privilege of an extended period of speaking then. Um, the second one, the, the, the facilitator will always say, please do not uh, emulate the first person. So as the process goes, please do not emulate the first person. So your time is very short. Now. Thank you, Program Director. I, I certainly will not emulate the, the first speaker. Um, my name is Dlatla Kumalo. Um, 
I spend most of my time with the Black Management Forum after, after work. Um, let me start by saying we, we must acknowledge the work done by, let's call them veterans before us, that the, the, the ground has been, you know, is fertile. The fact that in the opening remarks we heard that we are doing relatively well compared to other African states, that is a, that is a positive. But for me, DM, I think there are things that have to do with uh, what I call um, political willingness. There's this uh, sort of attitude. I work for the government, by the way. I, I don't want to name the department in case you want to measure my input. Uh, there's this attitude, DM, of treating disability as a by the way. Uh, I'm just going to make comments and perhaps you can reflect at the end. You spoke about disability um, inclusive indicators. And one thing I'm passionate about, DM, is the employment of people with disabilities. Because I think we can reduce the dependence on the grants if we directly employ people with disabilities. In your, in your example, you spoke about yourself. I also want to reflect about myself. I was funded by the Department of uh, uh, Higher Education through a grant that was earmarked for students with disabilities throughout my undergraduate and postgraduate. In other words, it's a NESFAS loan, but I don't pay it. I'm not sure if people are following what I'm saying. It's, it's directly earmarked for students with disabilities. So I came through that process. Um, it's, not, it's not to say that you are, uh, you are, you are uh, uh, going to be employed, but it's a necessary intervention that, that, that assisted me. I am employed, GM. I'm not advocating that I must be employed. I am comfortably employed where I am. The issue for me is I do not understand why government is failing to meet their own target of, of employing persons with disabilities. I've heard in other forums and other spaces, they are saying they, they, they are not there, we can't find them, they don't disclose, and the list goes on. I, I, I just want your reflection, now that you are present today, what, what is really, what is the issue they're really there? Because it can't be true that they are not there. They are, they are not disclosing and so on and so on. Uh, I mean, you, you look at government uh, advertisement, they will say, uh, if you don't hear from us within three months, you must forget. So essentially what that says, DM, is that in government, you hire on average three people a year. That's what it says. And then it says people with disabilities are encouraged to apply. That line is always there. You can, it's guaranteed, it's going to be there. But I don't see how this translates to people being employed. What, what is the issue really? Um, it for, it's, for, it's for any panel member to reflect on. For me, that's, that's the biggest indicator to um, the, So that we reduce dependence on social grounds. The issue of whether we are located in social development or precedence really is not an issue for me. I just want reflections on how do we practicalize what you call, um, how can we make the white paper a living document? So for me, I think let's, 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 do a, let's, let's talk about practical things. How do we remove people with disabilities from social development, from grants to direct employment? Thank you. All right. Uh, I think we had uh, five, but let's just finish the hands that were this side so that we, you don't find it difficult with moving the mic. There was one hand there. We'll take that as three, then there's four and five this side. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dave Mahuma is my name. Um, and, and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this session. 
I work very close with the expanded public works program where a provision of about 2% is made for uh, people with disabilities. And I'm quite inspired by um, you know, the, the, the debate regarding the reframing of current offering based on disability for the benefit of all. The, the question is, how can we reframe you know, the expanded public works program in a manner that it meaningfully accommodates the positive contribution of people with disabilities um, w without necessarily you know, pushing them towards administrative jobs. And I'm saying this within the context of the fact that the program is supposed to be labor intensive, number one. Um, and in most cases, people work in very, very you know, harsher environments. So, so, so um, given the debates that we've had today, how do we then reframe the offerings of this program in such a way that it meaningfully you know, um, benefits and, and, and contributes to uh, people with disabilities? Thank you. Thanks. Then I think let's do um, Singati, I'm going to abuse the advantage of having the mic in my hand and quickly raise my comment so that I can then concentrate on running with the mic thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> my comment, or oh my name is Boni Malefalo, and I'm in the Department of Social Development in the Branch Rights for Persons with Disabilities. And I'm going to raise my comment without necessarily raising controversy. Um, I'm going to bring this closer to home, back to the country. Number one, having listened to the reminiscence of the history through the disability rights movement this afternoon, and if the current developed policies in the country are anything to go by, as well as the trajectory of, the, of tonight's celebrations of the INDS, the UNCRPD, and the, WR, the WPRPD, Lastly, the strides made on the disability discourse as a country. And I really acknowledge the challenges that we are still facing as a country. But I personally think we need to commend ourselves and commit to doing more and pushing harder as a country. Thank you. that abuse of power. <laughs> Good evening. Um, this is a question to the panel. My name is Amanda Gibbard. I'm a civil servant. I know you have all said that you have rights. How are you going to make me realize your rights? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Uh, my name is Sizom Tibaniso. Uh, being from remote areas, it's true, struggle is, is there. And we are, being fa we are faced by a real struggles. The white paper, I've just heard about it, plus minus three months ago. So the, the, the question is, how can we bring it to life? I think implementation is the first step and making sure that uh, we, ho we hold those ac against implementation accountable. And for example, everything is there in the white paper. If I'm in, I'm in a situation whereby uh, I'm being not allowed to get into a taxi. How can I use uh, the white paper to fight that situation? I think that is what is needed. To be able to use a white paper for my advantage. Thank you. Uh, 
right, I think, yeah, I think those were the hands that we, that we took. Um, the there's, there's a suggestion that we take a second round of hands so that we give responses to all of them uh, at the same time. Um, I'll take that. There's one. Two. Okay, let's start there. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. I think that after we will then take responses. Then there's nine there. We'll take comprehensive responses on all of those of those issues that have been raised. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my name is Sonavile Zoniwe. Uh, my name is just simple, uh, and I would like to thank for the opportunity. Um, I think and I believe um, that to overcome the challenges of being a person with a disability, we need to remove the barriers. There is a lot of barriers that we are in at the current moment. As I was saying, like, employment is one of them, but employing a person to increase the number of percentage of employment is not helping the, the, the good living of a person. And then, because of you employ a person as a receptionist, and the person has got a big home. So the measure there, to me, doesn't make sense. We've got a challenge, a big challenge uh, with transport. Transport is a big challenge. I don't know how it's addressed on the white paper. I must just put it, but yeah, thank you. Sanbanani, Ikamalam Guma Musbong, Lesbian, Salukurum, Magisizur, and Clamp, Konosos, Wagara, looking for new clues. A Jangom Zad, Gilly Lang Lalel, Egal Kuas, and Jangatan Bubun Dota and Kulum, Yatabang and Jangas Bos and Jangom Zad, Ukuti, Ukurumang, technology, a technology, Lemining, a gas and Gibbon, and my farm, Lang Sugacon. Moba is cut a sneeze in distance around and Zagamat Rubin, who told you to my farm, this is in Tazinzik. And the muscle pega, Lama Pilava Kulumanga, who can I pilling in you pega cool at the strengthening of families. Tinis and Senda was a semi kayang and pella, Gonzagala and Nat, Esau, Mama Benga, Nekuba Zigil. Mobu told you to smang a big figure to two white cinema to Rubin, and then I don't do two lay, my sefigil is a Benzela Labo and Dabambal, Actina song is benefitai. And the Gakuba is in a jing at Langa, your mamma, Nabasal Benga, Nicoba Zegili, Safunu Bonushin, Jangan in Zitus, Kobegala Pambi, Zitola Matuba, Jangas of Zongas in Yangan, go to Toluguti, Scatter Sning, Zia Vinjel or Matub. So since I'm Janig, Stella Uguti, Uhun men waits, was Langa Bezi, as a Messan and Nat, who was overconning Goku was a sister who was born. And Nagas Lari last look to Abam Veteran, Abam Veteran, as a easy to go to Azikos Balu Pans, Sitola Lababantu, as a Baham Bilum Gama, Waya Pambi. Kuba Koni no ate pali wenga abo. Ugo za spoon de squa zokshia into tizi bantu na mbetu ya bong. I was tempted to ugudo liga nje ngase sondwe. Good day. Uh, my name is Amigo. Um, <coughs> I only want to indicate that maintaining. Uh, life of a person with disability is is too expensive um, <clears throat> i think that sh uh, 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 service provider the providers who are selling our devices uh, should be monitored their pricing must be monitored somehow i don't know how but they must be monitored so you go to I'm not going to advertise them. You buy a crutches uh, rubber for 20 rand uh, that you will only use for maybe three days. Then, yes, this is, I bought this one. I bought this one uh, yesterday. It means, yes, I, I bought them yesterday. They are finished already. Tomorrow we'll have to buy another one. How much is a wheelchair? A good wheelchair, not a hospital wheelchair. The, this kind, this kind of a wheelchair, you will get it uh, for somewhere around um, 11, 11,000 or so. 35,000, sorry. 85. 85. 
someone in the in the in the village somewhere where I'm coming from they can't afford they can't even dream of buying that that's a good uh, uh, deposit for for a car <laughs> so we can't before I, I, I loved I, I love what what Justin said that um, uh, those that are uh, are working maybe we, we should uh, uh, put um, aside somewhere in a pocket extra money that we have uh, to to help uh, uh, people living with disability somehow I, I I don't know how that will work but uh, it will be difficult still. We put aside money, we buy a, a, a good wheelchair for someone who is living where I'm coming from in the village, and then that wheelchair needs maintenance. Who's going to maintain it? Which money? So, uh, and the, the um, social development. May I please ask you to please help the Department of Health they are struggling. They are giving our disab uh, disabled brothers uh, these chairs. You know the chair, uh, the, the hospital chair. When you are sick, then you can't walk. Then they have to push you somehow. They are giving those chairs for them to use uh, for, for, for a daily uh, use. That's not fair. That thing will warm up in a, in a week or two. I think education is, is, is key. We are speaking now and debating because maybe we went to school somehow. We, we, we know what's right and what's wrong. We went to school. I think if we can... Uh, <coughs> disabled people can be um, given money to study from the primary and then high school until they finish, those who can't at all. Uh, who can pay for themselves. That will be a good initiative. Give someone an education, they will reason for themselves. They will want to do things for themselves. There is this thing now that I, sorry to the uh, 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 private companies and uh, maybe the, the, the government. They call it learnership. They're giving it to people living with disability, maybe, I suspect, for them to run away from tax somehow. Because you go from, from, from you, you went for a, 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 a learnership, and then when you go to SARS to submit, they tell you that you have worked for, for this company. He said, no, that was a learnership. They said, you get stipend. That was work. So, and you find a disabled person with about four certificates of a learnership. They are overqualified with four certificates. They can't get a work. Those companies does not want to employ them, but to use them to run away from tests. That, that's not fair. So I, I, I know that uh, every program that will be developed um, People will manipulate it, will manipulate it to, to, to benefit from it. But I think uh, the, the, the government need uh, field workers. People that will run to when someone does not want me to get into the taxi because, they, because I'm disabled. I should be able to report it somewhere. I think the field workers, I think that, that's very necessary. All Thank right. you. All right, uh, but McDonald's, Bramfontein have steps. People with disabilities want to eat those beggars. They are not nice, but... <laughs> uh, co uh, colleagues, I think the number of hands that we've got uh, will really require us, uh, require us to be precise with our, with our qu questions or comments. So if you can just keep it maximum to two minutes so that we can... Uh, we can conclude. Thank you very much for the invite. My name is Petrus. Um, 
I am from a, an organization called Sanda. I'm the youth chairperson. I just wanted to add um, on the logos that you have, and you have an image of a wheelchair when we apply for jobs. But I think you should add um, a logo or a sign for people with disabilities, all the different disabilities, because when you have just one sign for a wheelchair, it doesn't show that you're also um, accepting other disabilities. And the other issue is about education. So if it happens that a hearing person loses their hearing over time and they are put somewhere else or they become blind, um, so they, they need to be supported in order for them to continue living because they also have right, rights as people who are um, deafened or becoming deaf later on in life. Thank you. There were, there were hands that side. Oh, thanks, Mr. Singh. Uh, I'm Tabi Sopetuga um, from DPSA. Uh, one of our biggest challenges, I think I want to appreciate the panelists uh, uh, and perhaps move to agree with Usis Fuyo when you're saying the issue of institutions remains a challenge. And uh, my comrade there when he says we continue uh, to be oppressed by the so-called able-bodied. You see the biggest challenge we continue to face is that disability mainstreaming is never regarded as a transformation agenda issue. It is always regarded as a special case issue. Uh, you, you have situations where whilst we continue to drive transformation, either at an economic level or at an inclusion level, we tend to take disabled people out of that. I'll cite two examples. When you look at the Employment Equity Act and how it is reported on by the Equity Commission, they hardly talk about people with disabilities. And the reason for that is that the 2% that is mentioned, you won't pick it up in any employment equity plan of either a private organization or of government. It's a by the way issue. When you look at the current triple PFA that is actually propelling or trying to move the, the economic participation of the previously disadvantaged individuals, you find disabled people again packaged with the so-called blacks, whilst they are oppressed by the same blacks. And you find the military veterans taken out of the pack and made to be standalone because someone must appease them for having fought for the country and the risk that we're facing with the current political situation. So up until we, we stop regarding disability as a special project and we we make it to be a transformation agenda and stop this thing of identifying the location of disability within junior structures within government. I mean, I, I was attending a central program yesterday where they actually appointed a new transformation manager. We need to begin to appoint transformation managers in government and uh, justice Perhaps you must advise when you close, how do we criminalize oppression of people with disabilities? Because where do we go? I mean, we're told that we go to the Equality Court. There's no system even going there. I mean, we know that there are pieces of legislation that can support us. Even our lawyers don't understand how to help us get from where we are to the next point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kakeot, uh, a student advert. I'm part of the disability 
awareness movement advocates. So I would like to outline a few challenges in terms of even in institutions of higher learning. You find that when we speak about accessibility in all some buildings, they refer you to an act of heritage act which stipulates that no building does it a number of years, let's say a hundred more or more years must be changed. So we find ourselves in a situation where a student has to attend in that building, but the university is saying that they can't make it accessible. Then to bring on to the point of how do we make this policy alive with in a country where sports unite people, it saddens me that we don't have any national league for sports in disability. All you have is a week in a year that you go into a national game. But that's not enough because the awareness around sport for disabled people in South Africa, you get it when they go to international competition. And those competitions only select a few people. Where are the best? Where are the grassroots people like? Uh, when we look at the development on women and ableism, lastly, I would like to touch on the media. Media plays a very important role in society, but as disabled people, we don't hold our media accountable because you find that in the media it portrays disability as an accident. Tomorrow, when a disabled person walks around with a wheelchair, you would find that society thinks that that person is getting managed. And then we blame society, but we don't hold the media account like you find. An actor who, who plays as a disabled person, but without the necessary understanding of that particular disability, that they, they make uh, mistakes in their language, in their actions. They, we don't hold them accountable. Then. All right. Bef before we take the next hand, there's a, there's a request uh, from Deputy Minister. She says she indicates that she's got a live interview at nine. So she's requesting to quickly make comments on the questions and the remarks that have come through. Unfortunately, she won't be able to, re to reflect on the rest of them. Immediately after that, she'll have to leave. Um, so if we can just allow her that, uh, that privilege. Um, thank you very much. Let me apologize to the panelists for, it's just one of those uh, days where you just hear there and everywhere. 
Um, there's a lot that has been said. We appreciate and we want to say thank you. We've heard the comments. I think there's a few things that I want us to take home. One of the lessons that I've learned in the, in the time of doing work, it's that it's very easy to point fingers at others. Mm -hmm. But when we start asking the real question, where are you when those things happen? Because one thing about South Africa's democracy, it's very, it's very vibrant. So it's a very interactive and we are very in your face kind of society. Now, if you talk about BBEE or you talk about any piece of legislation, we need to t look at ourselves and say, when that happened, where were we? Were we sleeping and we woke up and everything happened? Sometimes, as I said, we allow the bus to leave the bus stop and then we want to run after it. So times like this require us to be better organized because the world is moving with or without us. And we need to decide, are we gonna be in the bus? Or are we gonna wait at the bus stop? Or are we gonna stand at some street corner somewhere? Now, just a few comments about a few things. Firstly, it's very important, um, I agree, pricing of assistive devices, it's very, very painful. Um, unfortunately, it's the, the laws of the universe and there's something called intellectual property that people with disabilities must take time and invest time and energy in understanding. Because for an example, assistive devices for visually impaired people, they, the manufacturers issue one license per country. So there's no competition there. So whoever has the license can charge whatever they like. And everything is imported. So as your rent goes down, so does the price of the Braille and Speak or the note taker uh, Justice Yakub is using or Eddie's uh, fancy wheelchair next to me. It's all important. We are a nation that needs to say, as we develop industrialization, to what extent are we as South Africans occupying that space? So we need to be able to, to ask that question. We know indeed we are concerned about the bedlocks of assistive devices and we continue to raise that every single day. Even in the report that we'll be launching, we also try to say to health what is being provided. The quality is very questionable. Um, the two last points that I think I want to make um, is on the issues of strengthening families and accountability. I remember in 1998 when the Employment Equity Act was being passed, um, we all jumped around, we all were like, yeah, no, we don't want, um, we want targets, you know, we don't want quotas, because quotas are going to do what one of the speakers said, make us receptionists and keep us there and make us busy. We want targets so that companies are able to plan. Okay, so we exercised our rights, we got our targets, we got our employment equity plans, we allowed the Employment Equity Commission to run away with us. For them to do what they like, like silently disregard us, and we just let it happen. When the Employment Equity uh, was reviewed, we also kept quiet. So the challenge, being in government, being a mother of disabled children, as I said, being a disabled person, I tend to have to play the devil's advocate all the time. And I have the opportunity of being there inside, but also being outside. Because the struggles of my disability did not disappear the day the president mentioned my name. Actually, they became more real. And they became more in front of me and they became more elevated. But every single day, when I wake up and face those challenges, I know that I have to do that which needs to be done because on my shoulders, I carry the many, many aspiring politicians with disabilities who will forever be measured on my performance. So if I sleep on the job, it means I am a gatekeeper 
Eddie will never become the deputy minister because they will forever tell her how you tell him how useless I was. So I need to try and struggle along. But in the journey, it's a very cold one mm -hmm. because people with disabilities are not there to support you. Yes. You raise the issues, you need the backup. Mm -hmm. And when you have the backup, the world moves. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we raise the issues, they become Henrietta's issues. Ah, you with her people. And the people are not there behind you. So we're just saying we have the opportunities. We are in a better space as this country. Let's make it work for our children. But we can only make it work when we support each other and not pull each other apart. And that is the ableism that Eddie talks about. We get preoccupied by the wrong energy. So let's re-energize, let's look forward, and let's make this thing work because we know how. We have all the instruments. Lawyers with disabilities, go make some money. Let's stop complaining about after the equality court, what happens? You have the degrees. Open your law firms, specialize on disability, and make a whole lot of money. And some of us will be there aiding you along and making sure we create disabled millionaires. Thank you so much for having us, and good evening. will allow you, Deputy Minister, to, to leave us whilst we continue with that, uh, that order. I'm, I'm really going to urge that we, we try and wrap it up um, so that we can give the panel the last opportunity to give comments. My name is Sipo. I'm, calling, I'm, from, I'm, I'm, I'm from Guazulu Natal. Um, Mamu Voyo, you, 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 you spoke about over a week movement my question is because we, we have got uh, the, the, the organizations of disabled people and the organization for disabled people and these people they need to come together and, and talk with one voice and you find that they, there are some differences there. And my question is, w what needs to be done there so that this organization, they can work together? The other question, I don't know who's going to answer that one. I heard the, the people to speak about employment. Lucky enough, I, I worked for disabled people for, uh, for many years, and um, I started my own company. Um, but now, the question of what registering the, the, the organization within the department, those also has become a, a, a barrier because you approach the transport department, they want your company to their database and they need a lot of stuff. You approach the Department of Health. They, they also, they want their own thing. So my, my problem is that why don't they recognize, because I, 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 my company is registered on the central database. Why don't they approach the, the, the government central database to get the information? But instead, up until today, I can't cover. They thought SIPO do that car for us, but you are not registered with the department. Yes, we understand that you own the you own the central database. Those are the barrier for us to I mean to I mean to advertise our I mean our our ability on what we are doing. Thanks. It was so short. I tried. All right. Um, that's the last one. Yeah. That's the last one. Good evening, everybody, uh, to the panelists. Uh, my name is Andrew, Andrew Lowe. Um, I don't want to uh, 
I'm working for the government, but I'm, I'm leaving them out. I'm not here on behalf of them. I just want to make comments on on two points. I think the doctor uh, make note of implementation and also touch on institutions. But before I, I will be very brief on, on both of them. I will be inclusive. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you understand the language inclusive, so I will be inclusive. I will try my best. Um, I would firstly like to, to, to just draw your attention to, to, uh, to what, uh, what uh, I think is the gentleman there when he talks about assistive devices. And I'm in that field, and I know exactly I'm, I'm, I'm in that technical field, uh, repairing and maintenance of those assistive and hospital devices. So I understand completely the frustration in that area. And adding on top of that, th there's no subsidize for those individuals, uh, subsidize in terms of maintenance on those assistive devices anymore because the department don't have the money anymore. So now everybody, everyone with an assistive device, he has to make his, his or her own means to maintain that and it's an expensive exercise. I usually say to people, it doesn't matter what type of a wheelchair you are on, but you are living in a very expensive life. Coming to implementation and also on the institutions, we, we are sitting with a big problem when we talk about, and I so appreciate uh, the, the introductions of, of, of where we are today and where the sector itself are today. But here is the problem is that we know where the sector are, but the people who live out there as the just, just as they have, have indicated to us, the people that live out there in the rural areas and the people that they are under those municipalities, and I'm talking a pure experience here, is that the people in power there, they don't know these documents. I have thrown the INDS in front of them and they asked me, what is this? And as I explain, it's more confusing to themselves, but they are executives and more than executives and they have all those powers. Now, what, what I think we can use and we can think about that is that Yes, we, uh, the, the, the disability, uh, I, I heard it have moved from presidential, we are standing now on an advisory team. And now, but I have questions to even to the advisory team in terms of gathering information. And what is their program in terms of gathering information and advising the president on the processes and plans that the government at the end of the day have. So that's, that's one. What, what are their programs? Are their programs so inclusive that they, at the end of the day, come down to a local municipality and have those sessions there, uh, which those sessions will inform them about the situation here that can indicate to the president's office to say that in, 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 in a place called Renfontein, uh, a Zenzele, this is the situation that people with disabilities have. But we won't, we won't know that. I don't know what is the program of the advisory team. I would like to know that. The other thing is also that why is it so difficult for us to have disability representatives within the municipalities and go away with the because there's this, uh, uh, I have a, a nice Afrikaans word for that, it's a hoha. This, there's this nice hoha which is, which is a, and, and, and many people might not agree with me, but for me, because I live in that situation, and for me it becomes a hoha. Because now when you put everything in one pot, it doesn't have the taste that you want it to be anymore. So why can't we have 
your disability and not focal points. Let's, let's forget, forget about focal points. But why can't we have disability desk that will address the issue of, of, of inclusiveness within the municipalities? By this disability desk, we'll make sure that every department within that municipality will have a budget that will be adding into this so that we can avoid whatever we are uh, uh, that focal point. I, I, I don't want that focal point because it becomes a focal point and it's, it's a dead one. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is on institutions also is that, is that um, uh, sometimes we be, we, we, when, when, when persons with disabilities are approaching these institutions, they are so, so anti-disability and it's, it's so difficult to, 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 to keep on saying one thing. I am saying, if you know I'm Andrew, why should I continuously give you my name if you know I'm Andrew, if you understand what I mean? If you know my needs, why should I come continuously before you, making you aware of my needs? The last point, and I'm closing with this, is I'm having a problem with one thing that we do every year in and year out, and it yields no results. Maybe the results were, is out of, and it's the, in the way we do the celebration, the disability celebration, the 3rd of December. And I think we also should think of how can we, 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 we bring value, remember what happens, what brings the, the 3rd of December to us have already given value to it, but we are in a process of decreasing that in the way we are doing it. So we need to really look at that also and bring back what the real meaning of the 3rd December is. Thank you. All right. Um, panel, I think I noted about 17 comments and hands in total. My sense is that you cannot individually respond to those. Um, so I will, we will give you a couple of minutes just for uh, concluding remarks, um, reflecting on some of the issues that have, uh, that have been touched on. Um, I, I see a caucus in the panel. Yes. Um, Dr. Maslati, I think, is uh, agreeing with Edi that Edi will start, then Dr. Maslati, then we'll end off with, uh, with Justice Jacob. Uh, in that order. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, so let me respond to um, some of the questions around this notion of reframing uh, disability um, in, in light of sort of the remarks I made earlier. Um, I think the disability rights movement has been very successful at, um, <coughs> at promoting compliance, at instituting compliance. And compliance is a really good thing, right? We want institutions to comply with legislature. We want society to comply with a forward-thinking, <coughs> positive attitude on people with disabilities. However, um, and, and in some ways, I, I think the disability rights movement can also learn from other social justice movements, like the feminist movement, for example, right? There are many kinds of feminisms, right? We know there's first wave feminism, which is about women attaining the right to vote, to vote. second wave feminism, which is about uh, grappling with the question of patriarchy, and, th and third wave feminism, which is looking at intersectionalities, right? So how do we think about Women is not just women, but women embodying a multiplicity of identities, right? So black women, various kinds of women, that there is no monolith called women, right? And so in some ways, I think what I am calling for is another wave, a new wave of doing disability justice work, right? There, the, the, so we can recognize the strides that have been made by the disability rights movement and also call for an intensification, uh, call for a deeper analysis of structures of inequality, right? So a new wave, uh, a third, fourth wave of disability justice, if you will. And as far as I'm concerned, this fourth wave 
of disability justice is a wave that interrogates the limits of compliance. Compliance is great, but compliance is not going to produce the millionaires that the deputy minister was talking about. Compliance is not going to produce, um, as a young person who lives with a disability, I there's an urgency and there's an impatience and I want young people with disabilities to be great, right? I don't just want us to have access to basic services. I want us to be powerful and powerful in, in an expansive sense. So I don't just mean powerful in the narrowly defined sense, but I mean emotionally powerful, spiritually powerful, intellectually powerful. And that power won't come um, on the insistence of compliance. It's like moving from negative 10 to zero, where zero is celebrated as the aspiration. So we've made compliance an aspiration. When has compliance, how is it possible that we are sitting in a moment where the aspiration is to be able to get onto a taxi? That is literally the aspiration that we have for the lives of young people with disabilities. And I think that that I, I think we often say that our frameworks are, are ambitious. I actually think they're not ambitious enough. I think that we need to insist upon, and, and I'm glad that there are people in the room, you, you know, when we talk about the National Development Plan or the Sustainable Development Goals from the UN perspective, there has to be greater ambition for the lives of people with disabilities. It has to move beyond compliance. I know that we're at negative 10, but zero cannot be the aspiration. It's got to move beyond zero. So in some ways, this is the reframing that I'm talking about, that disability as a methodology, as a worldview, not just an, an, not just an identity, but disability as an ideology demands that we demand more from society. We demand more from public policy, and we demand more from ourselves so that the ambition is not just compliance, but the ambition becomes power, real power. Thanks, Lydia. Justin? Uh, yeah. Um, so let me, let me start by saying that there are many disabilities all requiring a completely different approach, and the idea to unite them in some ways is wonderful, but the idea to treat them all the same is unrealistic, and we need to bear in mind those differences. Let me say also that the, the problems of poor people on the ground are actually extremely important and sometimes, depending on the kind of person you are, your circumstances can be so miserable that it is not even possible to have ambition. That is so for many, many millions of people. But I do uh, agree that for those who do have ambition uh, and can develop it, they should reach for the sky. But finally, I must say that the ambition must not be only about ourselves and about people with disability, because the struggle is a single one. The struggle to obtain a non-racist society, non-sexist society at all the three levels that uh, have been spoken about, the struggle to have uh, a society in which even gay and lesbian people are not discriminated against. All these struggles are part of one struggle. And we will succeed only if we unite those struggles into one. And one of the ways in which the disability movement succeeded in those days is that it became an integral part of our struggle for democracy. And now we have a struggle in our society, and I've got to say, that we must develop that struggle, that we have to reframe to make our struggle better, but not necessarily at the expense of ensuring that the niggling problems of people on the ground are dealt with. For me, both are of absolutely equal importance, and I have the sense that theorists quite often use 
the reframing, I'm not talking about you, the theorists quite often, and theorists in government quite often, let me put it more precisely, quite often use these theoretical reframing issues as an excuse for lack of delivery. They do it in relation to water, they do it in relation to electricity, and so on. I don't quite agree. I mean, Apple has made the iPhone suitable for disability only because they make more money out of it. That's all. It's a money thing. So if we said we will give the Jacob Zuma and the ANC a million rand each for every 20 million they spend on disability, you'll see the changes because the benefits will come there. So we do live, unfortunately, in that kind of acquisitive society. Having said that, there are good people. There are good people who work a great deal. It's a long struggle. Let us go ahead and participate in it at all the levels that, uh, that we have spoken about. Let us develop institutions. Let us develop people. Let us ensure that more and more people are empowered. Uh, I agree that there are problems in relation to employment, which we need to do, to do a great deal about, which we must actually do quite carefully. But in the end, I think it's, uh, we're involved in a very diff difficult social process in which both reframing and delivery are important aspects. I was asked specifically to comment on decriminalization. Uh, I, 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 I actually think that uh, criminalization, uh, uh, criminalization doesn't really help. I agree that there should be a disability help desk at every level of government, but not one in name, but one which has experts which understand and know about every disability because none of us is an expert on everything. <coughs> so we, we need to have those tables. We need to work together. We need to make sure that, that, that government um, works well. And I agree that disability must be linked to transformation, but it can be linked to transformation on that agenda if we make sure that our struggle for disability is actually part of everything else. So we've got to fight for the absence of corruption, we've got to fight for the rights of women, we've got to fight for the rights of people with disabilities. We've got to make sure that there's one struggle which goes forward towards everything and hopefully in good time we'll see better things. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Justice. Thank you so much. I think a lot has been covered. Um, just to, you know, I think the issue of the social revolution which the justice talked about is, I mean, in terms of where we are. And the, I, I really also am so, you know, enthused and excited about the whole framing. Um, we need time for that. <laughs> I won't even respond because it actually elicits a lot. You see, um, this is where you realize you are old in the room because you, you know, the whole conception of disability, you know, from a South African perspective, was a big discussion for so long and very intense by people with disabilities themselves. And it is no different in terms of the language across uh, of African and black and the whole issue of statistics that we're grappling with you know, what, do we want to be called previously disadvantaged? You know, so in a sense, there was a time and place where it was critical that our disadvantage is elevated for it to be appreciated as part of the redress agenda. Mm -hmm. And we actually are not, we've scrapped the surface as far as that redress agenda. But the younger people are beginning to say, why are you calling me that? So I think that this is timely, but we need the right space for it because there was a specific reason. It was actually not just about the negativity. It was uh, the people with disabilities themselves wanting to highlight you know, the depth of disability 
and how you know the prioritization at a different level so i think that it becomes important to appreciate that point as we deal with that because i believe we should and it's very exciting the issue also of albinism and disability you know these are concepts that i can only say i'm you know as a person who sort of has watched the space and has been part of it in different ways to say continue the dialogue it's good that this is a dialogue, and this dialogue shouldn't just be within people who are dealing with that. This dialogue should involve society, because I think all of us within society have to really appreciate where we are, because these debates are significant in terms of pointing to where we are. Um, and then the issue of employment in government, it is pathetic when you look at the numbers of you know employment in disability in government and i think that there's a specific agenda uh, sipo was asking the question and tabiso as well i think you know this is one issue that i believe that the movements of people with disabilities have to really push because the frameworks are there there's an issue of the pipeline and you know, when you have the movement, the movements are not just advocacy. The movements of today have to also provide the information. Mm -hmm. So the directories of the people in a particular municipality, it's not just at national level, at localities. So there must be mobilization at all levels. So that when that advert comes out, the person who's in Soweto should be able to say, why have you not considered? So basically, the visibility is, you know, we need to be active in a way that effects change. And not, you know, all of us as society, I mean, we have life as a demand today because we have become inactive. Mm -hmm. And I think that we needing to rethink, all of us, how we get involved. You know, the issue of EPWP also falls within that because the whole concept of disability is actually, you know, the problem that we're having is that we've got, you know, uh, uh, progressive frameworks. But the people that are employed have not been oriented yeah. Yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. So they use a different lens of just see it, seeing a person who's going to be a receptionist. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've come a long way from the switchboard operators mm -hmm. to the judges now. Why do you want to take us back there? So I just think that, you know, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, the school of governance has to find a way of reorienting. We need to find, and also within, uh, you know, the, the movements, find ways of how do we induct and reorient the people who are, because they, they, they have absolutely no clue. And the issue of media as well, is a very critical me, you know, point across the board. I'm just trying to touch on those, but lastly to say, um, the, the issue, you know, the, I mean, listening to the, the issue of devices and maintenance, it, you know, one of the reasons actually I found myself in, in the struggle um, or, as part of the disability rights was this issue. Because at the time, it was the House of Representatives and the House of Assembly and the House, you know, the, so. Difficult. You, uh, yeah. So you got your wheelchair and your devices from your house. Now there was a problem because the Pandus didn't have a house and the Pandus didn't have. So we had to fundraise uh, for the Pandus. So, you know, the whole thing of, you know, we, because we must also not forget the discrimination within, you know, the, 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 the because that is still a big problem. Inequalities within. And I mean, some of those issues to date, all those issues still, I mean, so it's frightening for me that we're still dealing with that as a big issue. And I think that it's, it's, it's just, you know, one of those, I mean, we've got young, smart people now, and they need to help us with the answers. Because some of us now, I'm talking like, you know, we, we actually, I have no appreciation 
in terms of the solutions. And I think that that's very important. So I just think that um, as, a, as, a, as a, an overall statement that the alignment of where we are, for instance, this issue of devices and aligning it with the cost of living. Mm -hmm. So the argument of reducing the cost of living of a person with a disability has to look at a package. And that package has to be defined looking at the realities on the ground. So I feel that it is not going to change somebody saying, how do you make me realize your rights? It is not going to change without this engagement. And we need to be basically understanding that these instruments that we have are only relevant if we practically engage and together find answers because we are not there yet to be able to make things happen without that engagement. Thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you to the panel. I'm not going to waste any time. I think we've way uh, past uh, our bedtime by now, some of us. Um, just one or two comments. I think let's, let's take the opportunity from our side uh, as the partners to thank in particular Justice Jacob and his wife for taking the time out. Um, they flew in from, from uh, Durban. Uh, this morning, uh, they're flying out tomorrow. Um, we thank you very much for, for your willingness to come and participate. Yes. Um, and uh, no less of a thank you to the local panelists, uh, Dr. Maslat and, and Eddie. Thank you for agreeing uh, to be part of the conversation. What I really want to emphasize as a closing remark is that I think we need to take this as round one of a four-round fight, effectively, because we've touched on broad issues um, which need further clarity in terms of us getting deeper into them so that we can refine them and be able to practically, as you're saying, take them to the next step. And I think the people around this room, in particular um, the, the, the panelists, we might call on you uh, on a much more a closed session which will be, have a much more dedicated <coughs> period of time where we can be able to refine some of these issues together with the Department of Social Development in, and DPME in order for us to look at concrete policy pro proposals that can come out of this Tambo debate series around the theme of it, disability inclusive development. I personally have learned a lot today. Um, I think one of the issues that we were raising with Lydia when we were planning this is that we did not want to create a platform for uh, disabled people uh, where they just talk among themselves, but a platform where it would be inclusive of all sectors of society, where everybody comes in and joins, joins in as part of that conversation. And I think we've been able to achieve that today. Um, and I think it's been a very fruitful conversation that we've had. And thank you to yourselves as the audience. We have supper outside. I know it's very late. However, in the language of government, we do not want fruitless and wasteful expenditure. So you need to eat and get as full as you can. Um, so with those words, thank you very much. Um, so we'll find each other at s uh, snacks outside. Thanks very much.